This is the eighth video of Twisty Puzzle Math. And I'd like to talk a little bit about subgroups today. So we've been talking about the mathematical object, a group, right? Which is a collection of elements you can combine in some fashion. When you combine them, you get something else still in the group. Our primary example is the cube. The things in the group are moves you can do to the cube. If you do any of those moves in succession, you have another move on the cube. So, how many, how many things are in the cube group? Well, it turns out, and we will calculate this in a later video, there are 43 quintillion. I'm not even sure if I'm spelling that right. And the proof involves some things um, about the parity uh, of permutations, uh, even odd permutations, uh, these sorts of things. I want to take some time to do right. Um, so we will get to that calculation. But this is a lot. This is a, a ridiculously large number. So how do you sort through all those different permutations to find the moves that you need for the cube? Moves that move a couple edges or a couple corners. So far we've discussed um, commutators and conjugates, and of course sometimes you just mess around. And in all of these, we're analyzing the cycle notation to find useful moves. Well, I want to add another tool uh, to, a tool to our tool kit here, and that's the notion of a subgroup. So this is a group within a group. I want to illustrate it with an example. So consider all the moves generated by R squared and F squared. This is a very small group. If you only consider moves generated by this group, it's going to be inside. This means a subset. It's not a C. Um, sort of um, like a U on its side. So this means subset of the cube group. So in the cube group are all are, are plenty of moves which only have R squared and F squared. But that collection is itself a group. If you only combine R squares and F squares, you only get things within this group. So this little group is um, not too hard to analyze. And so you can look at some patterns Right, there's the R squared move, there's an F squared move. You can look at R squared, F squared, and, and you can continue. And it'll turn out, I'll let you do this or perhaps I'll do it in a separate video. It turns out this is not a very complicated group and you very quickly exhaust the group and you can characterize the group. So what about a more complicated group? A more complicated group, um, and th there are a number of them, might be this one, which looks very similar. This is a fairly large subgroup, and we'll calculate the size of these groups after we've gone through the process of calculating the size of the cube group. But there's a lot more going on in here. In fact, we've already seen um, one element of this group. We looked at the move FR in an earlier video, and we found out that it has an order of 105, meaning that on the classic Rubik's Cube, that if you do this move 105 times, you get back to the identity. That's a pretty complicated move uh, that's in, in, in this um, particular group. Um, so so th this is a, a fairly important um, subgroup, actually. There's some useful moves in there. Um, another one is the slice group and also the slice squared group. And what this is, is you only consider moving the center layers. So this is um, this move here, you might call it R sub S, the right slice group. There's a move that you might call F sub S, which is the front slice group. 
and there's a move you might call u sub s, which is the up slice group. There, there are different notations for this, um, but this is the one I like to use. And so you can consider um, these moves and what they do, and notice that they don't affect the corners; they only affect edges. So that can be that can be useful. So the point of these smaller groups is they they narrow down uh, the goal. They give you something bite-sized to explore. And, and it might seem overly restrictive, but it's not. When you're solving these puzzles, you ought to be able to get a, a good chunk of it just by spatial intuition, by familiarity with the puzzle. And so you get down to the point where you only need um, fairly restrictive moves anyway. You don't actually need a move which permutes eight corners um, or maybe all of them, uh, you know, or nine edges. You could do most of that on your own. And so investigating these restricted subgroups um, is more helpful than it might seem at first. They can be awfully fun if you look at modifications. I've discussed bandaging cubes before, and I have a couple that I've bandaged, and um, I used an epoxy to glue the cubes together. You don't have to do that. You can just use tape. And I've cut out some stickers um, just to practice the idea of modding. Uh, many people use an epoxy clay, uh, like epoxy sculpt. Um, I'm hoping to get some of that, but I, I haven't gone there yet. But this puzzle is a puzzle I, I like and I've solved, um, obviously not recently. And I'll have a video on this. So this subgroup, if we put the 2 by 2 by 2 out back, this is a manifestation of the group generated by U, F, and R. And so this is this is a little more challenging because you can't use um, two adjacent sides. So if you have any moves which use a U and a B, uh, sorry, U and a D or an R and an L, they will fail on this cube. So you have to explore this smaller subgroup to see what kind of things, what kind of algorithms you can find. Um, the other bandage cubes I have don't form groups. And so that can be a little trickier. You notice in these puzzles here, um, what moves you're allowed to make and what moves you're not allowed to make depends on the orientation of these layers. I can turn the right layer right now, but if I make, um, say, an F prime, now R is no longer available. And so it can be difficult to write down algorithms for these because uh, what works one moment may not work the next depending on where this big chunk is, right? And this chunk can travel around the cube, which can make it more difficult. And these are two other bandagings that I've uh, just played around with a little bit. So, uh, oh, and, and one more, one more subgroup. So this is um, an ordinary cube, it's not hollow, but it mimics the structure of the void cubes, the void cubes group. I do have a void cube. Um, it only occurred to me after buying it that I, I could have just played with this puzzle. And even if you buy a void cube, I recommend doing this. It's it's helpful in solving it. There is a, a little twist of the void cube. And I don't know if you can see it in the video, but I scratched then uh, a letter for each color. And it's faint enough that when I have my glasses off, I'm myopic. I can hold this away from my face and I can't see the scratch. And so I solve it as if I'd be solving this cube, not knowing what the color should actually be. But then when I'm done the puzzle, I can investigate the configuration of the colors. So if I come across some unique endpoint that's unfamiliar to me, I can try to form a hypothesis based on the orientation of these marked centers. Um, so, and, and it's worked. I've, um, I think there's only one case to solve in the void cube. And I have, um, so we'll, we'll see if that's the case, if I find any other ones. But this is the concept of a subgroup, and um, future videos will analyze some subgroups more in depth. I hope this is helpful, and uh, that's it.